After decades in the shadows, there's a resurgence in studies looking at the potential use of psychedelic drugs to treat a variety of psychological issues. Back in the 1950s, tens of thousands of patients were treated with psychedelics. A 1966 CBS report called LSD, the Spring Grove Experiment, looked at the treatment. These strange images and sensations are part of the experience of the drug called LSD. But this scene shows LSD as it looks and sounds far from the glare of the headlines in serious medical research. In the late 1960s saw a dramatic shift in America's views of psychedelics. The research was halted and erased from mainstream medicine. Michael Pollan is the author of five New York Times bestsellers, including The Omnivore's Dilemma. His new book is How to Change Your Mind, What the New Science of Psychedelics Teaches Us About Consciousness, Dying, Addiction, Depression, and transcendence. Michael, good morning. Thank you. Huh? And we must add, this conversation is not an endorsement of the use or experimentation with illegal drugs for medical purposes. So, Michael, why this topic? How did you get started? Why did you get into this? I was, uh, I was reading some of these studies, which I thought were frankly so crazy and implausible. I mean, people who were dying of cancer, uh, struggling with depression and, and anxiety and fear, being given psychedelic drugs, psilocybin specifically, which is the ingredient in so-called magic mushrooms, to help them deal with, uh, confront their mortality. And that seems so uh, odd to me that I wanted to explore what it was about. And I started interviewing these people, and they had had these transform, a single guided psychedelic session. In other words, they're with someone the whole time, they're wearing eye shades, listening to music. They would have an experience where they went into their bodies, confronted their cancer, uh, looked at what would happen to them after they died, had these powerful spiritual experiences, and they emerged having lost their fear and anxiety in 80% in of the cases. Mm. In, in conversations about legalizing marijuana, advocates often had to fight through the sort of Cheech and Chongization yes. of, of marijuana. <laughs> Talk about in this context with psilocybin and LSD and all yeah. of that, how is the science done, and how is your ability to write and talk about this not just swamped by all of that yeah. history you write about? Well, I, I, like everybody else, my image of LSD and psilocybin was that 60s image of drugs that were being used as party drugs very carelessly, kids taking them to go to concerts and things like that. I had no idea that long before that, as your clip showed, uh, they were a very serious subject of, uh, they were thought of as psychiatric wonder drugs. And uh, when they escaped the lab and were embraced by the counterculture is when you got this backlash. And we're still kind of getting over that backlash, but it seems to be happening because the research has been so compelling uh, so far. It's not, we haven't completed the process of, of figuring out what they're good for. Did what it do the most promising studies show? The most promising studies show that the drugs are very useful in dealing with depression, uh, and there will be a very big phase three trial. Um, and it's important to understand how few tools psychiatry has to deal with mental health problems in general. I mean, the last major innovations was uh, the introduction of Prozac in the late 80s. Mm. And those antidepressants aren't working very well anymore. They're, they're fading in their effects. They're, they only do a little bit better than placebo in trials. Uh, and people hate the side effects. They're very did, hard to get off of. Did it change your way of thinking because you tried some of these things? And I wish you'd share with us what happened to you and your wife. And did it change your way of thinking about it? It did. I did have some what transformative did you try? experiences. I tried psilocybin. I was very interested in duplicating. Those are mushrooms. These, this is the mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very interested in duplicating what the research that was going on at Johns Hopkins at NYU. And I had a guided psilocybin trip. It was underground because I didn't qualify for any of the trials. Uh, and I worked with a guide who was very talented, very professional. And I had this uh, incredible experience of, it was a fairly high dose experience, of my ego or sense of self absolutely dissolving until I saw myself, and I know this sounds paradoxical, spread out over the landscape like a coat of paint. Yet I was still perceiving this. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize for the first time, and this is what I took away from the experience, is that we're not all identical to our egos. Our egos push us around a lot. Our egos punish us. They defend us against new information from the world and from our subconscious feelings. And suddenly I saw my ego in a new light and that I was, uh, it was something I could control a little bit better. Now, I might have gotten that in 10 years of psychotherapy. I don't know. But I got it in an afternoon. You write in the book, though, that we don't die well in this country and that maybe psychedelics could help and we should really legitimately think about that. 
Yeah, I mean, look, we have very few tools to help people who, are, who have fear and anxiety as a result of a, a terminal cancer diagnosis. Prozac doesn't help them. Um, we need to address what is really a psycho-spiritual distress, and these drugs appear to help with that, and they're part of this conversation we're having as a culture about how to die. And I think that is really why they will be approved, uh, because there's, there's really nothing else for people in that situation. And this really does appear to help them reset and confront their death with more of a sense of equanimity uh, and, and perhaps a sense that the end of themselves, their own egos, may not be the end of everything they contributed. You talk about them being approved, though. We've seen with opioids and other things that as a culture, yeah. this gets out of the box and runs all over the place. There are bad trips. There are downsides to people who self-medicate. So how is that possible to keep Very this important to, to talk about the risks. I looked at this carefully. I was a very nervous Nelly going into this, these psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm, not a, I'm a very reluctant psychonaut. Um, but um, they're relatively non-toxic, less toxic than alcohol. They're non-addictive. If you give a, a rat in a cage a lever to press, you know, and you put cocaine on it, they will press and administer cocaine till they die. Put LSD on it, they'll do it once. They'll never do it again. Um, so they're non-addictive, anti-addictive. The risks are psychological. When they're used carelessly, uh, which is to say without a guide, sometimes people have really bad trips, uh, most of which are just panic attacks that people recover from. But there are occasional psychotic breaks or episodes. So people really have to be careful uh, and, and treat them as the powerful medicines they are. All right. Well, Michael Pollan, thank you yeah. so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.